Hey, what's going on everybody? Justin here and in this video I want to share eight books that I think look really interesting that are going to be released here in this month of September. Uh, this is definitely, like I said before, this is my favorite kind of staple booktube video, these upcoming like monthly releases and everything. And I made sure to include I think four-ish science books to kind of go along with the uh, science reading challenge that I'm hosting. If you don't know what that is, definitely check out uh, my science reading challenge announcement video over there or down below uh, and then come right back here but yeah let's just uh, go ahead and get started with a few of the history ones so the first one is the muse of history the ancient greeks from the enlightenment to the present by oswin murray and i've read one other book by him uh early greece here which is part of um a series covering uh the the kind of ancient classical world. I think this was put out by Harvard. I want to say like the 80s or 90s. And so it's been a long time since I read them, but I do remember distinctly that I did like that one and I like the one on like the Roman Republic. So uh, I know he's pretty famous too for um, a lot of kind of like early, like kind of like Dark Ages Greece, uh, Greek history and that sort of thing. Um, and this one is all about uh, how through like, you know, the 1500s through the about 1900 or so, um, how the ancient Greeks were sort of interpreted uh, by uh, Western society and stuff and sort of the different ideals and takeaways that they um, Yeah, like took and try to like run with like for example in the 1800s this sort of pure um, pure democracy from uh, ancient Athens uh, how a lot of uh, societies kind of want to like emulate that um, and use it, so, I, not as a cover per se, but kind of as like a context of how, you know, it's theoretically possible to do some of these things uh, and some of the revolutions and uh, stuff like that. Uh, and it also goes on to the present day. And apparently uh, the author, what he does is uh, kind of uh, explores kind of the different trajectories that he thinks, um, I guess, different Greek values and different Greek ideals um, are going to be used going forward um, in the following or in the upcoming uh, coming decades, I guess, um, and kind of different, uh, I guess, values and uh, I guess uh, movements that are going to try to be. I guess they're going to try to use uh, Greek ideals to kind of push their agendas and stuff like that. So it sounded pretty, pretty interesting. So it's kind of a blend of like history, historiography, and like almost like future projections and stuff. So yeah, I'm not 100% sure what to make of that per se, but it sounded really interesting. Uh, next up, we have A Noble Ruin, Mark Antony, Civil War, and the Collapse of the Roman Republic. Now, I haven't read a specifically biographical work just on Mark Antony. I've read, there's like a whole cottage industry of uh, works on Cleopatra, such as uh, this one, which I won the Pulitzer Prize somehow. And I, I thought it was pretty average, to be honest. Um, but I've also read like, for example, The War That Made the Roman Empire, which is by Barry Strauss, which is all about the war between Mark Antony uh, and Octavian, who became uh, later became uh, Emperor Augustus. Um, but yeah, like Antony really is kind of an interesting figure. Um, he, I, I think, a lot of people have sort of interpreted him in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, but he was very polarizing with the leading figures of his day. Obviously, he's kind of like somewhat of a protege of Julius Caesar. You know, the love interest of Cleopatra. The more kind of the uh, you know. Uh, keep your enemies close, or what is that? Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer. First with uh, Octavian, and then just became like, more mortal enemies. Uh, um, after that, kind of the second drummer bit fell apart there. Uh, you know, like Cicero thought he was just kind of like the lesser of a bunch of evils for uh, for a while there, uh, and then you know Antony kind of put him put him on the hit list there and stuff like that. So like I said, he's got a whole bunch of just kind of conflicting things sort of going on, and Shakespeare. Kind of takes almost like with his uh play uh antony uh you know he's kind of like a fairly subdued like chivalrous kind of guy um i find so it's just kind of interesting and like i said i've never read a pure biography of him uh so i don't i i do remember he's covered a lot in like a lot of these other books but i think it might be interesting especially if it's like a, a fairly unbiased uh account just kind of taking all his actions and then being able to I mean, you can never really do like history in a vacuum per se, but um, you know, obviously in like a war uh, against Augustus where Augustus is the victor, you know, there's a lot of propaganda and stuff kind of going on, um, you know, as far as like East and West, especially in, in, that, uh, in that conflict and 
uh, everything like that. So I think it's just kind of interesting. Plus, like, you know, anytime you have an ancient classical biography come out, uh, I feel like that's just a good reason to kind of read some more in either ancient Greece or ancient Rome or what have you. So uh, I'll be looking forward to that at some point. Next up, we have Nexus, A Brief History of Information Networks from the Stone Age to AI by Yuval Noah um, Harari. Uh, Harari, I don't know why I said Harari. Uh, and I'm like one of the only people on earth here, apparently, I feel like in the, at least on booktube, in the nonfiction sphere that has not read Sapien. I haven't read Homo Deus. I haven't read, uh, was it 21 Lessons for the 21st Century? I don't know. I get kind of nervous when like nonfiction books get hype. Well, even like fiction books too. But when books, especially nonfiction, just get hype to like no end. Um, I remember when those, especially Homo Deus and uh, uh, Sapien, when they came out. I mean, everyone and their mother and brother were like talking about it and singing their praises and everything. And I, I don't know. I just get kind of skeptical because I always, I've, I feel like I've been burned a whole bunch of times. Uh, from books like you know where like literally millions of people actually like read it which is kind of odd for like a lot of non-fiction works and kind of like an outlier and this one i don't know so let me know down below if you've read any of his works and like what you thought of it that might like sway me i just kind of want to put this one in there just i know he's super popular and a lot of people have enjoyed his stuff um but yeah i don't know too much uh about it it's basically um kind of taken the concept of information and obviously information networks but information how it's developed over time become more complicated uh but how information has to, like uh i guess to have like a a successful like progressive nice society um you have to have like kind of this balance between information just being purely neutral like raw data effectively um and also just like you know is just a weapon effectively there has to be some sort of uh middle ground there's gonna be a lot of discussion on you know uh disseminating truth along with information because not all information is true um stuff like that so it does sound kind of interesting um i don't really think you need to have read the other books um even though it's kind of like in that same format but um let me say like i said let me know what you think of his works if you've read them before chances are a bunch of you have um i'll maybe give something uh, a shot at some point next up is the last, this one is kind of like a political philosophy book um, and kind of history and stuff. Um, I have been, or I have been lucky enough to be sent by Crown this work and it's On Freedom by Timothy Snyder, which comes out later this month. Um, he wrote kind of like a little short, I don't want to say pamphlet, uh, uh, called On Tyranny um, uh, a couple years ago uh, with, you know, the rise of a bunch of like pretty bad regimes <laughs> all over the world and stuff like that. But he's written a really good, um, history of eastern europe called uh the bloodlands which is all about uh you know all the poor people that essentially were uh you know starved to death taken over killed uh sent to like gulags and all that stuff um in eastern europe basically between hitler and stalin uh in you know the 30s and 40s of this century and how they're kind of like overlooked uh in a the big grand scheme of things just because of all the other like horrors and atrocities that have gone on and i know um uh, like my friend uh, uh john over at nicholas of ultra court i'll leave a link to his channel down below as well um he's the one that put me on to uh that title and how good it was um but this one is kind of uh, a whole like kind of political philosophical outlook on the concept of freedom uh and kind of going forward uh, how it's been used in the past but also uh, you know, kind of the right kinds of freedom, like what kind of freedoms do we need going forward uh, to kind of create like a just and free society, obviously, yeah, but it's kind of like a circular thing if you think about it. But one of the interesting takes, uh, just because when I was doing kind of a little bit of flipping through the book and reading some like kind of uh, reviews of it and stuff like that, an interesting take uh, that I read is it's not so much uh, the importance of freedom, it's not necessarily the importance of being free from something, uh, you know, like, you know, like in the United States, we're always talking about like, uh, you know, freedom from like government overreach or whatever. Um, so it's not necessarily being free from laws and stuff that you don't like, um, but more about freedom to do things uh, like, you know, freedom to 
uh, live how you want, freedom to, you know, take risks and be successful and things like that. So I found that uh, really interesting. And this might be one I'm going to try to somehow squeeze in along with all my science right uh, science reading <laughs> that's going to be going on this month i'm not quite sure how i'm going to get to it but uh like i said he's pretty prominent um in like modern political uh history circles and stuff like that so i am excited to uh get to timothy snyder's on freedom all right so next up let's get to four science books because like i said i wanted to include some science recommendations for people if they you know really like in enjoying new works and stuff if they're participating in the reading club so first up one i thought was pretty pertinent to 2024 we have eclipse and revelation total solar excuse me total solar eclipses in science history literature and the arts by henrik lange and tom mcleish and this pretty much says what it is on the tin. It's just a complete history of eclipses. Um, there's gonna be like the science of, you know, how they work, you know, how they occur, all that kind of stuff. Maybe some of the information we can like learn from uh, study eclipses and stuff like that, but also how culturally we like viewed them, uh, like, you know, superstitiously, for example, I always think of like, the, like one of the earliest um, eclipses that we can date accurately uh, was during like the war between, uh, uh, what was it the uh, the Persians and the Lydians uh, against like King Croesus, for example, um, and like you know how they stopped the battle and stuff because everyone was like, well, that's you know that's obviously like a sign from the gods and whatnot. Uh, but kind of like you know I I don't know too much about like eclipses and art and stuff and literature, so I think it's just kind of fun to like learn more about that. Uh, I don't know, eclipses really are cool. Like I happen to live in a really I was like. A couple miles from like literally the path of like totality uh and stuff earlier this spring just a lot of fun uh you know i know there's a lot of like eclipse chasers and stuff but yeah that was actually really cool this first time i've ever seen um a total eclipse and yeah just kind of want to like learn more about them now that you know i experienced that so there's there's that one um, next up is Planet Aqua, Rethinking Our Home in the Universe by Jeremy Rifkin and this is all about changing our perspective I guess. so it's like a philosophy and science book uh the big thrust of the book is changing our perspective of uh viewing the earth as you know it's got these continents that a lot of the you know everything organisms live on and stuff but more thinking of the earth as a water planet rather than a land planet um which you know obviously there's a lot of marine organisms organisms and stuff but you know being terrestrial we always have like kind of that uh, kind of terrestrial mindset of things on the land and stuff but his whole argument about the hydrosphere you know the atmosphere is full of water you know the majority of the planet is covered in water the majority of like the mass of you know um, the biosphere and stuff really is has water and stuff and it's all about learning about how important you know the ice the fresh water you know the marine environments and stuff how really how crazy of factors they play in sort of uh, environmental preservation and stuff. Obviously in this kind of like era of climate chaos and climate change and everything, um, you know, we talk about like obviously like rising temperatures a lot and things, but um, when the hydrosphere is totally, like, you know, uh, different weather patterns are screwed up and everything due to uh, global warming and whatnot, you know, that's what leads to like torrential flooding, droughts, things like that, which have, you know, a huge effect on actual like populations and everything like that, besides just, you know, um, uh, temperatures being like, you know, above or below normal. So I think that's just going to be kind of an interesting, like really hard science book with a lot of like up to date uh, uh, studies and data and that sort of thing with kind of a little bit of a philosophical kind of bent as well. Plus the cover is uh, pretty dope on that one as well. Uh, next up is Living on Earth, Forests, Corals, Consciousness, and the Making of the World by Peter Godfrey Smith. I read two of his other works, read Other Minds, The Octopus, The Sea, and The Deep Origins of Consciousness uh, a long, long time ago. Super excellent. If you like Soul of an Octopus by Simon Montgomery, definitely check out this one as well. It's all about kind of like the mental and intellectual capacities of uh, cephalopods and how uh, they might even have a uh, higher level consciousness uh, like we do, which is pretty interesting. Um, also read his Metazoa, which is all about kind of the development of the mind and uh, I guess intellectual life of literally the animal kingdom, which is also like really good. Highly recommend that one as well. Um, but anyways, this one is a little bit different in so much it's not about like the development of consciousness per se uh, with life on earth, but how organisms, whether that's fungi, 
plants, bacteria, animals, or whatever, um, have actually affected the planet and kind of changed the course of, you know, evolution, changed the course of like planetary history. Um, which sounds like really crazy, but uh, from other stuff I read, just for example, there's like one of the great extinction events uh, was essentially like the great oxidation event where a lot of the algae and stuff that was starting to, the first organisms that really started to photosynthesize, um, oxygen wasn't like a, oxygen generally is actually pretty lethal to a lot of organisms, um, you know, when it's in uh, higher concentrations and stuff. And the atmosphere didn't have a lot of uh, oxygen, but all of a sudden when tons of uh, algae and bacteria and stuff are uh, photosynthesizing for the first time after, you know, a few million years or whatever, uh, all of a sudden the atmosphere just gets flooded with oxygen that was not there before, uh, just as a byproduct of all this photosynthesizing going on. Um, and many organisms just like could not adapt uh, fast enough to the oxidation event and stuff. So I think it's gonna be kind of like along the lines of stuff like that. So it just sounds really cool. Like I said, I've read two of his other works and I found them fascinating. Uh, just a really excellent kind of science uh, science, almost a philosophy of science writer, and that's actually what he is. Um, he has another book that I might be reading for uh, the Science Reading Challenge at some point. Um, it's called uh, Theory and Reality, which I think is, I don't know if exactly if it's a textbook per se, uh, but it's a pretty, it's one of like kind of the go-to standard works um, that are uh, modern works anyways on the um, philosophy of science. So if you've read that one by any chance, let me know what you think of that uh, down below. Um, I've heard really great things from like the few people that I know that have read it. So yeah, I like I said, that might be one I plan on reading um, at some point. And then lastly, we have, let's see, doo -doo -doo -doo, Our Green Heart, The Soul and Science of Forest by Diana, excuse me, Diana Beresford Kroger. Um, she wrote To Speak for the Trees, um, which I need to pick up a physical copy. I listened to that one on audiobook a long time ago, and for whatever reason, I'm, I still haven't picked that one up. That one will definitely be a reread. So essentially, it is the Irish Celtic version of Braiding Sweetgrass, if you've read Robin Wall Kimmerer's Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, Diana was uh, essentially grew up in, in rural, rural Ireland in almost like a quasi-Druidic tradition and stuff, as weird as that sounds. Um, and so she kind of takes that like kind of indigenous perspective along with all the hard science that she like learned at school and everything like that, and kind of combines the two uh, with her um, just kind of uh, conservation efforts and scientific studies and everything like that. And it's just, like I said, the best comparison I have is the, like I said, the Celtic version of, <laughs> of braiding sweetgrass. Um, and she does studies like all over, uh, she know, I know she does them in Europe <clears throat> as well as in Canada, for example, if I'm just thinking of some of the examples off the top of my head. Um, and this one is all about kind of the interconnectedness of forests. I assume there's gonna be like kind of dealing with all the kind of like um, undergrowth mycorrhizal networks and things with fungi, um, how a lot of trees actually communicate with each other through different pheromones and then also through the roots underground they support each other through like different nutrient exchanges and stuff um it's even um interspecies sometimes so i think that's just like super interesting um as well as kind of like a cultural uh like how human different human populations have utilized forests um and kind of their different uh, connections with different forests uh, around the world as well so it just looks really awesome uh like i said i loved uh, to speak for the trees fantastic title um, as well. You know, I love the Lorax there. So yeah, uh, that is eight books uh, coming out this month in September. Let me know what you think of any of these. If you've read any of these authors or if you would be excited to pick any of these up, let me know which one it would be. Thank you so much for watching. If you made it this far, don't forget to like and subscribe, all that kind of good stuff. Don't always plug the channel that way. But uh, anyways, whether you're reading new releases or works of science or history or what have you, always remember, Read victoriously.